So hi, we're at Book Market, and we're here in Whitby, Ontario, in a curling rink, which is the first time I've done interviews at a curling rink. How about you, Rob? Absolutely. I've never been to a curling rink, let alone been interviewed in one. So this is a very Canadian uh, experience. It's like visiting, you know, the Arctic. Every Canadian probably should go to a curling rink at some point. So our guest is Robert J. Sawyer, and full disclosure, uh, I have been interviewing Rob for almost 30 years now. That's true, since 89 or so. That's right, yeah. 89, Golden Fleece, your yes. first novel. And here we are, you're working on your 24th novel. Yeah, isn't it amazing? It's that been a long journey for both of us because you were back Prisoners of Gravity and then Imprint, Space the Imagination Station and all kinds of other exciting projects along the way. Yeah, but I've always admired you because you, that's a lot of books. That's almost a book a year at one period of your life. It was for a long time. How did you keep that going? For, well, you know, um, a healthy degree of personal debt is a motivator, <laughs> but also I've been extraordinarily lucky that I've been a full-time freelance writer since I was, well, since I was 24 and a full-time novelist since I was 32, starting in 1992. And, uh, you know, my American colleagues are astonished that I was able to do that so early in my career. And it was Canadian socialized medicine. I was able to say, you know, I don't need a job just to have health care, right? I'm taking care of and say to my wife, we're, I'm take, we're taking care of, right? The worst that's going to happen is we're not going to eat well while I do this novel thing. And she was supportive of it. Um, but a year of full-time work did yield a book on a reliable basis. It wasn't- And, and it was part-time. You had a full-time job while you were doing that book. No, no, no. I'm I had, thought you were. I, you, you were never. writing Golden Fleece and you had a job. Uh, in, well, my full-time job was being a freelance nonfiction writer. Oh. I haven't okay. had a job like where there's been a boss and a paycheck since April 30th of 1983. The anniversary <laughs> just passed and I celebrate it every year. Even though my boss, John Keeble, is a great guy, but I haven't had a, wow. haven't had a job since then. No, I've been entirely freelance. So you're work, currently working on your 24th novel, uh, The Oppenheimer Alternative. Uh, well, first of all, let's start with the title. I mean, uh, this sounds like it's about the Manhattan Project. Yes. So how did you research it? Is that stuff unclassified now? How difficult it's is that? It's quite fascinating because there have been maybe a half dozen or more novels about Oppenheimer over the years. Uh, and every uh, period of time, whether it's 25 years, 50 years, 75 years, new things are declassified at whatever level they were. So there's always new stuff becoming available about the Manhattan Project uh, that was simply uh, kept secret from historians until most recently on the 70th anniversary of stuff, some stuff became available, 75th anniversary is next year. So I just immersed myself. I didn't know, you know, I'm a baby boomer, so I'm post-World War II. I didn't really know all that much about World War II. My parents lived through it, obviously, but I didn't. Uh, and I'd always been aware that uh, physics had figured prominently, science had figured prominently for the first time in warfare. Uh, it really had been a scientific enterprise that was driving the ultimate conclusion of the war. Um, and I'm a pacifist, lifelong pacifist, uh, and I was very curious about what, if any, misgivings the scientists had while they were creating the atomic bomb, after the atomic bomb was used, whether uh, any of them sought some form of redemption for what they had wrought. Uh, because not only did that, you know, they destroy Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but they gave rise to the entire Cold War, to the era of nuclear fear, to what we're facing right now with rogue states like North Korea getting into the nuclear club. All of that goes right back to Oppenheimer and his crew in Los Alamos in 43, 44, 45. Uh, and they, to me, the ethical and moral implications compelled me to uh, write a novel about these guys. So, so that might confuse some people because you're known as a science fiction writer. Yeah. But so how much science fiction is, is this more about uh, science than it is about so fiction? So it is a science fiction novel. My conceit is this. See, at the end, of, the World War II ended with the bombing of Nagasaki, the second city that was destroyed, on uh, October 9th. Uh, I think it was 6th and 9th or 3rd and 6th of, of August. Anyways, August 9th. 
1945. Well, that's just before the beginning of a new academic year, after Labor Day, September 1945. All these scientists who had been working on this mesa in New Mexico were scrambling to take university appointments, Dis dissipated, disappeared. And this team, the greatest assemblage of physicists ever in the history of the human race, suddenly evaporated almost overnight into academia. And what I've concocted for the plot of the Oppenheimer alternative is just as they're wrapping up their research into developing the atomic bomb, they discover an existential threat to the entire planet, a solar instability that will wipe out Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and Earth's moon with, by the year 2030, by a year that's looming quite close to us right now. And so instead of all going to the four corners of the world, they stay together with an opportunity. You know, uh, Oppenheimer's famous line is after, after Trinity, now I'm become death, the destroyer of worlds. It's their opportunity to become life, the saviors of our world. There it is. That, that seems high very concept. elliptical. High concept. Now, speak of high, so you are known for a lot of your high concept yes. work. And in fact, that has made you attractive. Well, you, you, let me put it that way. Yeah, attractive a, to right, film and television. I always television. have a certain je ne sais quoi. But f you've been very attractive property for film and yeah. television. Lots of stuff has been optioned. And about, oh my God, 10 years ago, Flash Forward was a TV show. Yes. Based on your novel. So tell me about that experience. And as you're about to get more media exposure and spinoffs, what did you learn from the experience of Flash Forward that you're now bringing to the table on these new projects? Well, it's funny you should say I'm known for my high concepts, because that's true, I am. But Flash Forward, when I sent that to my agent before it was published, my Hollywood agent, Vince Gerardus, before the book was even published, uh, he said, this is the one. This is going to get made. And I said, well, that's great, but I've got these previous books. Kind of nice if any of them had gotten made, too. He said, no, no, all your books are great, but this one survives the elevator pitch. This is such a high concept. Everybody on Earth blacks out for two minutes. Those who survive wake up with memories of the future. You can describe it in two sentences to anybody, and they go, oh, really? Are the memories true? Well, yeah, it turns out they all are. If I saw you in the future, you saw me, we corroborate each other. Can they avoid their fate? Well, that's the driving question of the novel. So it's very easy sell. So I'm gonna have no trouble selling this. And he set out to package it as, as one does. And he brought in David S. Goyer, who was at that time one of the top Hollywood screenwriters, meaning movies. He had just done, as you would well know, Batman Begins. And uh, David uh, wanted to do television. He also wanted to do features, but originally this was going to be a feature. David was mm. on board to do it as a feature film. And then he did start dabbling in television. And here's a trivia question. We have a little audience here. Prior to starring in Game of Thrones, Peter Dinklage had a previous TV series. Anybody remember what it was? Science fiction show. Also starred Brent Spiner from Star Trek The Next Generation. Completely forgotten, it was called Threshold. Threshold was a series about experts in emergency management who had been hired by the US government to do contingency plans for earthquake, tornado, you name it. And as a throw in, the final plan they did as the package was alien invasion and lo and behold it happens. And suddenly they're the ones who have to figure out to a spearhead uh, fighting off the alien invasion. And Peter Dinklage was the star. David Goyer and Brandon Braga were the producers of that show. Brandon, best known for having co-written over 100 episodes of the various Star Trek franchises. So David and Brandon were both separately fans of my novels. One day at lunch on working on Threshold, David, Brandon said to David, what, are you working, what else are you working on? I said, oh, I got this Rob Sawyer novel I'm adapting for a feature, uh, uh, Flash Forward. And, Dave, and Brandon said, no, no, that's a great TV series. And David said, no, it's a feature. And Brandon said, no, it's a TV series, and here's how you do it. And David said, how would you like to collaborate? <laughs> and the pilot script came out of that conversation where Brandon was brought in. He had this vision of how it could be done episodically. Uh, and it came from that. And uh, so the whole thing pivoted to being TV. We actually sold it to HBO. 
And then HBO looked at the budget for the pilot, and this was pre-Game of Thrones, so their most expensive thing at that point had been Sopranos. And they looked at the pilot that was gonna cost about $12 million to film, not a lot for a feature film, but tons for an hour of television, and they balked and said, we can't afford that. So HBO shopped it around and ultimately sold it to ABC. So the final credit on the ending credits of Flash Forward is in conjunction with Home Box Office. Um, but it was a circuitous route, but eventually it did get made. So what are currently being developed right now for television? I have two, I have one here in Toronto. Uh, you'll know well, Kelly. We're Ar in Whitby, you're not in here Whitby. in Toronto. In the greater Whitby, which puts the greater in greater Toronto, I'm sure. <laughs> One, everybody, you certainly, Mark, know of Kelly Armstrong, the New York Times best-selling Canadian fantasy writer. And she had a series of very well-regarded and popular novels about werewolves. And a producer here in Toronto named J.B. Sugar, Joshua Bruce Sugar, adapted uh, that for space and for sci-fi as a TV series called Bitten. Quite a success. But Bitten ran its course and JB was looking for his next project, and he'd had this great success adapting a popular Canadian series of books. And he came to me uh, and wanted to do my novels Wake, Watch, and Wonder as his next project. And uh, we, I must say, uh, were my agent, Vince, sometimes known as Vinny the Thug, that's what your old boss, Moses Neimer, used to call him, Vinny the Thug. Uh, you know, we were pretty tough with JB, but ultimately it took a year, we came to a deal. And um, we recently landed a showrunner, which as you know, is the executive producer who is responsible for running the writer's room, the head writer, the vision keeper, the person who is responsible for all the creative decisions. And honestly, I mean, television, by the way, is a team. Yes. Any cog in that machine isn't working, it, you have trouble, but the showrunner is really the chief cook and bottle washer. That's right. Very, very important creative Dave person. Goyer was our showrunner on Flash Forward, and we found a wonderful writer named Shelley Scarrow, S-C-A-R-R-O-W, Scarrow, who recently won a Writers Guild of Canada Award for her writing on the TV series Winona Earp, one of Spaces and Sci-Fi's hits. And she has agreed to write our pilot um, and be our showrunner. We're very enthusiastic about that. I will write for the series. I will be in the writer's room. But you need somebody who is used to herding all the other cats and dealing with production budgets and schedules and all of that, and that's Shelley. So that is at the stage where just yesterday, Shelley sent in her, I think it's her third draft version of the outline for the pilot to me and to JB. JB and I are the executive producers of the show along with Shelley. And we're, uh, I haven't had a chance yet because of here uh, we're at Book Market, but tomorrow or the next day I'll read over Shelley's outline and give my notes, JB will give her notes, and then she'll settle into actually writing the pilot. We brought in your old compatriot, Rebecca de, Bas Rebecca de Pasquale, who was the programming head for space, right? Uh, and uh, she had been the one who'd greenlit Bitten, for instance. And, and a lot of other shows. And a lot of other <laughs> hits at Space Orphan Expanse Black. and yeah, Orphan Black. Expanse, yeah. And uh, Rebecca is wonderful, but she was recently downsized out of space, as, you, as were you, as were many well, all of people. space got downsized. So. All, all of the wonderful yeah. creatives at space. Space is now... Are you calling me a creative person, Ron? You are. Uh, oh, absolutely. <laughs> oh, with your, your wonderful Prisoner comic book, for instance, you absolutely... Mark Asquith, wonderfully creative. But they were all let go, yeah. and yeah. now space simply is a vehicle for shows that are packaged by other people, uh, yeah. often from sci-fi, but also elsewhere. Anyway, so we hired Rebecca to come in and consult with us to make sure that uh, what Shelley was producing was in line with what broadcasters are actually buying. Which, uh, by the way, that changes all the time. All the time. And one of the most difficult things is that people, it, it's a, like a stream, I feel, that there's yeah. a lot being produced, 10,000 scripts probably come in, came into the office every year, and of those, they might decide to do two yes. or three and the tastes of executives and the tastes of what they feel um, the audience wants yes. are very different so very hard to sell a zombie series until 
The Walking Dead. Very, very hard to sell a big fantasy series until Game of Thrones. That's right. And science fiction had that problem as well. That's right. But you kind of, fi- you know, flash forward was part of, and Lost were the shows that said you can do this, and what was called slipstream science fiction, where a modern audience uh, will watch this even though it's science fiction. That's right. With, uh, you know, sort of set in the near future of the present day on Earth, uh, it's not all special effects and prosthetic makeup uh, and CGI and, uh, yeah, uh, there's... Character, character, character. Character is always character, always character. Um, but talking about those ch- those changing tastes, five years ago I was hired to adapt my novel Triggers as a feature film. It never got made because the production company shifted its focus from features to television. But Triggers had as its main character a female kick-ass white Secret Service agent. And its secondary lead was a male African-American Secret Service agent. And the producer said at this time five years ago, you can't lead a show with a kick-ass female, (laughs) right, a a, a, a feature. You can't lead a feature film with a kick-ass female. So reverse the roles. You can lead a show with an African-American male lead, but not a kick-ass female lead. That was five years ago, and now everybody is, no, 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 it doesn't matter. We were thinking, this is before Idris Elba really took off, but he was our dream casting, right? And we couldn't afford it. We would love him still perfect part. But, um, but I was, and I said, that's astonishing to me that, no, no, nobody will go see a kick-ass woman leading a film. And then, of course, Wonder Woman and all these other films came along, and they did. Uh, and now, certainly, you can still lead a film, and we have, you know, for 10 or 15 years, you've been able to open a film reliably with an African-American lead. Um, male only, now male or female, but now also more so they want, even for a male audience, a female lead that kicks ass is what's the number one thing Hollywood's looking for for right now. It changes, and it changes out of sync. I think literary stuff is always ahead of the curve. Literary is proactive, and film and TV is always reactive, right? That's the, so. Now, if I was going back to writing the script today, I'd go back to what I'd originally had, right? Yeah. Okay, so we've talked about WWW. Yeah. Uh, what's the other TV shows right. currently being developed? Um, so, very interestingly, I, uh, when I was um, looking for a showrunner for a show I was developing here in Canada that never went anywhere, this was a thing called If that I was doing with Steve Holman, we were looking for a showrunner. And I had met uh, a woman named Anne Kofel Saunders at the Hugo Awards ceremony back in, I think it was 2005. I was up for a Hugo, or 2006. I was up for a Hugo for one of my books. And she was up for a Hugo for having written the episode of the new Battlestar Galactica where they brought back the second surviving Battlestar, the Pegasus, with um, what's her name who played Ro Laren on Star Trek, Michelle Forbes as Captain Kane. She was up for the Hugo Award for that. So we were just chatting, and I remembered she had a Canadian connection. I couldn't remember what it was. And I thought, what the hell? I'm gonna see if I can find her phone number, and I could, and I called her in Los Angeles and said, hi, you don't remember, blah, blah, blah. Rob Sawyer, uh, I said, of course I remember you. I love your books, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, we're doing this show in Toronto, and we need um, a showrunner. And I remember you have a Canadian connection. Are you a Canadian citizen? No, I'm not. I'm married to it, and she is. Phil Saunders, her husband, is the designer for the last X number of films of Iron Man suits. He is the guy who designs Iron Man's Iron Man suits. He's a wonderful uh, industrial designer, creative designer, works in Hollywood. Phil Saunders. And so she's no, you know, and I said, oh, well, then we can't use you for this project. But you know, you know what my favorite novel of all time is? And I said, no, it's your novel, Rollback. And I've got this script commitment from Sony uh, Pictures Television to write my own pilot. And I would really love to adapt your book, Rollback. You know, I'm sure it's under option. I'm sure it's not available. And I said, well, as a matter of fact, it has been under option, but it's not currently. It is available. And she said, please, 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 please. So she wrote a pilot for Sony. Sony loved the pilot. Uh, When you're commissioned to write a pilot or any script, you're obligated for two drafts and a polish. By the time she'd finished the second draft, Sony said, 
all we've got for the polish is typos. We love it. And they did sign off on the polish about 10 days ago, and now Sony is in the process of hiring a director to direct the pilot in Los Angeles. Then when you get the director on board, along with your showrunner, you start casting. So that is actually even farther ahead than Wink, Watch, and Wonder is at the moment. Two irons wow. in the fire at the moment. Yeah. And how did you get a, around the she isn't a Canadian? Oh, but Wake Watch, the rollback is for the States. It's Sony okay. Pictures Television Los Angeles. Okay, so, so we're not we're matter. not doing it under WGC or or Canada, you know, tele, various telefunds in Canada or anything like that, CMDT money or anything like that. C, Canadian Media Development Fund, CMDF. Okay. All I remember is they shrunk a submarine at one point and injected it in a guy's carotid artery. That was CMDF. This is deep. There's nerdery. one guy laughing. <laughs> one There's very... Gunnar Wentz in the audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One guy remembers the 1966 film Fantastic Voyage. And, and while we're on the subject of Fantastic Voyage, it is one of there are two old properties that I have always wanted to do. I did a graphic novel of the prisoner with Patrick McGo and Leo McKern. And then they said, because they always do this, you know, so what do you want to do? And I said, well, either two things, Logan's Run yes. or Fantastic Voyage. And they said, oh, well, Fantastic Voyage, that's tied up because that's a Brian Singer, the guy who did uh, the X-Men right. two films. He wants to do. And yeah. so that has been, people have wanted to do it for over a decade and, and, and nobody it's been ever tied has. up. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, but if you had a dream project, what would it be? So, you know, I may retire in the not too distant future, and I say because my Planet of the Apes fan film is not going to write itself. <laughs> I got to make time for it. And seriously, my own dream project. If I if I had, if somebody could offer me a dream job right now, ironically, it's the one Anne Cofell Saunders just got, being a staff writer on Discovery, the new Star Trek series. But my dream project, I've talked about it with some serious Planet of the Apes fans for a number of years, is a, is a classic Planet of the Apes, a continuity fan film called Sex on the Planet of the Apes. And it's not about, it's not porn. When you made Planet of the Apes, when they made Planet of the Apes in 68, what it was about, the two biggest issues of the mid-60s, civil rights and uh, the fear of nuclear war. What are the signal issues 50 year on, it's all gender relations, right? And in uh, Planet of the Apes, when Taylor's ship crashes at the beginning, the one female dies and Charlton Heston, the other two guys live and Heston becomes the main character. I wanna do an alternate history where it crashes and Stuart, the woman, is the leader of the survivors and she goes off to explore the gender politics of the three different simian groups. You never see in all of the original Planet of the Apes continuity, you'd never see female orangutans and you never see female gorillas. Female, uh, male gorillas keep harems. Female uh, uh, gorillas, sorry, female orangutans are subject to constant rape by beta uh, orang males, beta morph orang males. It's horrific, but it's true that it mirrors in that oddball way that science fiction should do the worst parts of our cultures in terms of how women are treated. And I think there you could really do a profound gender relations thing with a female-led, female-human-led Planet of the Apes thing. And I'd love to do the classic John Chambers ape makeup and go to Malibu Creek State Park, which is where they filmed the originals. And just that, that would be a dream project for me. Because you know I was involved with Star Trek Continues, the fan film series Star Trek Continues. I wrote the two-part finale for them, which was such a blast with perfect recreations of the original uh, series sets in, in, down in um, Kingsland, Georgia. Such a blast. So final question to you, and I'm, I think I'm going to ask this to everybody today, but um, you come from a place of having won almost every award in science fiction. You've won the Aurora the Hugo Award, the Nebula, a bunch of other awards. I don't mean to denigrate them, but no, no, there are no, too uh, many on your shelf. Yeah. So what would your advice to the young writers starting out be? What would you say to them? And this is more important than ever today, quality over quantity. Everybody is thinking the way to do it is to crank out four to six books a year for Kindle Direct Publishing. And there's a, you know, there's a, um, a Facebook group called 
uh, 50 books to 20K, which is all about as soon as you, right? Is that the right series of numbers? Maya Wentz just nodded. If you can get 50 books out, you'll make $20,000 a year and you're set for life. Um, but the memorable books still and always, why are we coming back and making a third version of Dune? Because Frank Herbert put his heart and soul into Dune, right? He didn't crank it out. He did everything he could to write the most important book that he possibly could. And in the long run, it's going to be things that challenge the writer and challenge the reader that are remembered and stay in print forever. The reason you have to do five books a year is because nobody cares about what you wrote five years ago. They only want what came out this month. So quality over quantity. On that note, thank you very much, Robert J. Sawyer. Thank My you, pleasure. Everybody. Mark Asquith. Thank you all. Thank you. And Joe Mahoney, who brought us all here for uh, Book Market at the back of the room. Thank you, Joe.